Good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you're coming in from, and welcome to our webinar. This is the, the first webinar actually that we're organizing to, as a build-up towards this conference, the Unlocking Solar Capital LAC conference, uh, probably more will be, be following. And this webinar is titled Coming of Age of Financing Solar PV in LAC. Um, just a short introduction to this webinar. Um, in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, we see more and more solar PV projects getting realized. And uh, that's, of course, spurred by the auctions and the enabling policies. Um, financing remains an, uh, an issue, though, and the vital role is being played by DFIs and multi multilaterals like IDB Invest. Um, the question arises, though, what's needed for the commercial banks and in institutional funders to become more actively involved in the financing of solar and lack? Um, to discuss these issues, we have uh, Elizabeth Rodrex to, uh, from IDB Invest to represent the multilaterals and Corker Barrack from, uh, from LACCOR. Um, and they are here to shed their lights on these topics. Um, I will shortly take you through the agenda of today's webinar. Um, like I, I will give a, a short introduction. Uh, after that, both Elizabeth and Corker will give a presentation on the topics that you see on the screen and mainly are the key, the key considerations for investing in solar PV projects in Latin America, both from a multilateral or slash DFI perspective and from a commercial bank perspective. Um, after this, there will be a Q&A uh, with Elizabeth and Jorge, um, which, uh, which is the end of the webinar. Um, for the Q&A, I would, would like to mention to you already, in your screen, you can see a, a chat box uh, in which you can drop questions. Uh, our staff here at, uh, at our office will uh, take care of the questions and uh, we will ask the questions to Elizabeth and Gorka. So I would like to encourage you to ask already questions during Elizabeth and Gorka's presentations and also during the Q&A session itself, you can still uh, ask questions. If you have any technical issues, you can use the chat box as well. And the uh, presentation slides and the recordings will be uploaded soon later this week. Um, a short uh, introduction to the conference that we're organizing this webinar towards. Uh, it will be titled Unlocking Solar Capital uh, LAC. It's the second edition of this conference. First one was last year in June. Um, and for this uh, conference, we are very happy and proud to, proud to announce that we will work, work together with LAC Core. Um, of whom, uh, who is also represented by Jorge in this webinar. LACOR is the Latin American and Caribbean Council of Renewable Energy. And together with us, Solar Plaza, we hope to organize a two-day conference on 28 and 29 June in Miami, uh, where we expect uh, over 200 top-level exec executives uh, to engage in in-depth discussions, uh, both on stage as off stage, uh, to solve LATAM solar energy funding gap. Um, more information of that can be found on the website that's uh, on the bottom of the, the page. Um, for this conference, we, like I said, we work together with LACOR and uh, the parties that you can see on the screen are the proud sponsors of this event. Um, we as Solar Plaza have organized over 100 events, as you can see, all around the world. Uh, and we're very happy and proud that this one will be added as, a, as one of the next conferences. Um, we were established in 2004, organized trade nations conferences in emerging markets and the more established markets. Um, before we start with the presentations, I have a short poll question for you uh, to see who uh, we actually have in the room and how much experience there is. Um, the poll question will be showed on the screen as, as we speak. And the question is how many megawatt of solar PV uh, you have developed or financed, depending on what role you take. So we can see how much experience there is. So you can now do uh, some voting. I see a lot of votes are already coming in. Uh, we will keep the poll open for a few more seconds. Yeah, I see most of you have voted by now, so we'll close in, a fi in five seconds. So, and now you sh should see the results on your screen. So you can see that most of you have uh, quite some experience actually. Uh, with more than 100 megawatt developed, uh, but also there are quite some people that, that don't have any experience yet or less experience. So I think that's good for Elizabeth and Jorge to also keep in mind when giving their presentations. Without further ado, I would like to continue to uh, with Elizabeth's presentation. Uh, Elizabeth Robrex is the lead investment officer of IDB Invest. Uh, she has she is mainly uh, ha have experience in 
markets like Brazil, uh, Uruguay, and Chile. Um, her focus is on the origination and structuring of financing for utility scale renewable energy projects in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and she has uh, experience of, in the or, or origination and negotiating of financing of, of projects, both in, in multiple renewable energy uh, technologies. So Elizabeth, I would like to give you the control over the keyboard and mouse so you can start your presentation. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, everyone. As Adrian said, my name is Elizabeth Roberex. I'm an investment officer with IDB Invest. IDB Invest is the private sector arm of the IDB Group, the Inter-American Development Bank Group. We're a multilateral lender in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, the bank is, um, the IDB is the public sector arm, which would be lending to governments with a guarantee and IDB Invest is the private sector arm. So we lend um, to private companies and for projects taking the project risk. I have in my uh, presentation, I have a number of slides about IDB Invest. I'm not gonna spend much time on them, but I wanted to include the information, mainly the, um, try to move forward, there we go. Mainly, I wanted to just point out that we are, you know, we have a $7.1 billion portfolio. We operate in a number of sectors, um, you know, including energy as well as manufacturing, health, education, a number of sectors. We, we invest with um, a number of financial products that we can apply in a very tailored way to find solutions for various projects. And we also play a big role in mobilizing additional investment for these projects from commercial banks, from institutional investors, and from these donor funds that we use. And I, I want to particularly mention the donor funds because they've been really critical in the role that we've played for renewable energy in the region. Uh, we've been able to use these funds in some creative ways that we can talk about later. But they're, they're a key um, value added that we bring to the region, we think, for this sector. Uh, I wanted to focus today, we've done a lot of work at IDB Invest with um, renewable energy. It's been a focus of ours for several years. And particularly in the PV solar section, sector, we've worked a lot in a number of countries. Um, and we've seen some evolution over the past five years or so. And, and what I wanted to talk about today was focusing on a, four of the most active markets where we're working and the kinds of changes we've seen, um, how, how mature the markets have become and, and what we see as being the critical points. Some things are challenges, some things are advantages that will be determining um, the future of PV going forward. And so I want to start with, with Chile. In the case of Chile, we, we financed in 2012 the first utility scale solar project in Chile, the Pozo Al Monte project. And, and now, um, as of five years later, um, about a year ago from, from today, there was 1.9 gigawatts installed and operating. And so a lot more than that is, is probably online by now, almost a year later. And a huge amount. Um, has been given environmental approval. The issue that we're finding now in Chile is the, you know, the, the over-contracting. CNEX is reporting that about 7,600 megawatts of renewable energy, not just solar, but all kinds of renewable energy, will be connected, not, not are approved, but will be connected, uh, contrasting with projected growth and demand of about two, uh, 2,000 megawatts. So the issue of over-contracting you know, is going to grow. It's not going to get any better in the short to medium term. The solar projects being all sort of focused, many of them focused in the northern SIC, the northern, um, which is a little bit up from Santiago. There are two main um, transmission systems in Chile that are now connected. And, and, and in the SING, which is the, in the northern part above the SIC, those projects a lot of them are connected in the same substations. And so you've had a lot of issues with respect to curtailment and, and spot prices have been pushed very low. And, and so merchant financing really isn't an option. But, but more than that, the issue of, of the over-contracting also makes banks sort of 
less confident in the PPA that's being awarded in the auction process with the distribution companies because it's not a take or pay PPA, it's a take and pay PPA. So um, these are limiting factors, all sort of created ultimately by transmission constraints, which are particularly severe at certain points, as I, as I mentioned. And this is an issue that we'll discuss. It, it relates to a number of countries, the, the issue of transmission constraints. Looking ahead, as I said, we see this, this will continue. The duck curve misalignment of production of solar versus peak demand will continue uh, to become worse in the short to medium term. But we see that Chile would be a prime market for storage and particularly battery storage to mitigate these issues. Uh, financing will be a challenge, um, particularly as overcontracting um, continues. And even if you win a PPA for 100 megawatts, the banks will be asking how much will the distribution companies actually purchase. Uh, moving forward, in, I wanted to talk a little bit about. Um, you can get this. There we go. The next country would be Mexico. There we go. In Mexico, it's also a pretty mature market. Uh, the energy sector reform that took place recently has been positive for Mexico, for PV solar in Mexico. Definitely over four gigawatts of solar have been awarded in the three auctions that have taken place so far. The average PPA price has fallen from $45.6 per megawatt hour to a little over $20 in the most recent auction. This is the sign of maturity for sure. Um, and there are a lot of potential off-takers that would be sort of industrial off-takers as well. So there's a lot of potential activity in the market, a lot of construction going on, a lot of projects being financed. The, the, the PPA is pretty complex in this case, and the regulatory framework is only getting more complex with the addition of this clearinghouse structure. And so looking ahead, we see that complexity is a little bit of a risk in the sense of the new elections and the potential support that we assume that there will continue to be support for renewable energy. But any changes made to the framework, I think, will create some confusion because I think a lot of companies are just starting to understand the, the PPA and the, how to calculate the penalties. And, you know, it's a complex uh, framework of calculating the prices. There is major competition of new gas pipelines that are coming online currently under construction. And so this inexpensive natural gas from the U.S. is coming down and will be a major competitor for P PV solar. And we see a similar issue in certain places, not as severe in Mexico, but this duck curve issue as well um, taking place. And again, storage we see as a, a real potential mitigant to this transmission limitations that have been um, that we see in a number of markets. Brazil is less developed in terms of solar. Brazil, all four of these countries, I should mention, you know, the renewable energy is being fueled by the development, by these um, auctions that the governments are running to award PPAs. And in Brazil, the auctions have been incredibly successful, mostly related to wind. And there's now a shift um, that's happening to um, include more solar projects. There is an intentional shift from by on the part of the government to move away from large hydro, and that has really been positive for all kinds of uh, for wind and solar. There's very little solar installed right now in Brazil, unlike Chile and Mexico, but a lot has been tendered, 2.2 gigawatts. It's a little more expensive than in Chile or in um, um, Mexico, mainly due to um, lack of financing and the need to source your panels within Brazil if, you know, the local content requirement that BNDS, the local development bank, includes in its financing. And so there's very small, you know, production right now of, of solar panels in Brazil, and it's continuing to grow, but it, it they're, they're more expensive, certainly, than the, the panels um, produced in other countries, and it does add cost to the project. We're currently working on, we're co-financing with BNDS for solar project, the Pirapora project, which includes locally manufactured panels. 
we are guaranteeing um, the issuance of debentures by the sponsor to allow institutional investors to come in and offer um, long-term financing to the to the project. So our guarantee will reduce the eliminate basically the project risk that the investors are taking, and thereby you know get everyone more comfortable with solar um, until there's more of a track record in Brazil. And and I think probably most people looking ahead have seen BNDS's recent announcement that it's going to really ramp up its financing, um, and and which is sort of surprising to some. Um, it announced recently lower fees, longer tenors, and higher limits for itself to be financing alternative energy, as it calls it. So we don't expect BNDS to be stepping back anytime soon. Um, there is a lot of regulation that's taking place to favor or distributed solar, so that's another sector that's going to be growing, I think, in all of these markets. And um, the, the most limiting factor, aside from the supply of panels in Brazil, continues to be the lack of access to financing in REIs. Um, BNDS will be there. BNB is a bank um, in the northeast of Brazil that's also very active, um, but there still is very little participation or none by commercial banks in long-term financing for these projects. The the panels in reais with the as panels become cheaper and cheaper, there's sort of this tipping point where you know sourcing panels from the outside can make sense as well, and a number of developers are doing that. But they are all of them, I think, facing challenges in in raising financing. And then finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about Argentina. Argentina, the Renovar program that has been really successful has been the foundation of really strong government support um, for renewable energy, and they've established very aggressive targets and tax exemptions, and they've created this fund to backstop these um, projects, the payments to the projects called the FODER. And, and the project, the program has been very successful. 1.7 gigawatts of PV capacity have been awarded, uh, 41 projects. The average prices have, have fallen between the, the three rounds of, of, of Renovar that have taken place so far. All these things are signs of, there's maturity taking place, you know, but it's still a very new market. Um, we're not seeing a whole lot of commercial banks being willing to come into Brazil on a, you know, a project finance basis, or I'm sorry, Argentina on a project finance basis yet. Uh, a few with ECA coverage, but there really hasn't been a lot of movement yet from commercial banks to really be actively financing these projects. Most is being done by development banks and, and, and ECAs and um, bilateral uh, development banks. The looking ahead, we see projects, um, that will be completed this year. There has been success in completing the projects that were supposed to be completed so far. So there's positive things to talk about right now. It's really important that the projects come online as expected so that the government doesn't have to make a lot of payments of debt service to banks that aren't, aren't being paid by the project because that would be a challenge if the FODER uh, fund were not sufficient to cover those and, and it would reduce confidence. Um, there is work being done to introduce net metering to have some residential and commercial PV systems put in place. And, and we think, you know, little by little, the success that's demonstrated will promote bankability and the potential for other types of off-takers, industrial and commercial off-takers, and access to long-term financing. So these are the four markets where I think we're seeing the most activity. We do see evolution in the market, some of them faster than others, but there's been a lot of activity in the last five years, a lot of positive activity. And what we see going forward is that the next wave that's coming, which we want to be prepared for, is storage, because the limiting factor for all of these markets has been transmission, or a limiting factor, I should say. And so storage and the cost of the battery storage being uh, falling so significantly um, is, is what we're looking at next. And, and we want to be able to be there as we were introducing the first renewable energy projects to introduce now, you know, this new technology that can really be a game changer, we think. Just to briefly say, Chile is quite advanced relative to the other countries. There are operational storage assets mostly related to utilities right now in Chile. 
the the cost is as everyone knows has fallen significantly and and is projected to fall even further so the idea of a pv solar plus storage combination and competing really really well with natural gas is not that far ahead um away at this point um and it's you know we're sort of on the precipice where there's a lot of discussion a lot of consideration a lot of research being done and the applications are almost endless particularly for you know this sort of load shifting to allow um the projects to better pv projects to better align with the peak consumption mitigating intermittency basically that causes issues and and the by the utilities this enhancement of the ancillary services and just generally speaking stabilizing um transmission and and making it more flexible which we think can add a lot of value in every country there's huge potential um there are upstream benefits including you know for countries that have a large lithium deposits and for us you know one of our main focuses right now is on small and island countries where we see the battery storage technology to be really relevant i'm working now on a project in haiti with battery storage and you know given the reliance on diesel and and hfo in those countries and the vo the vulnerability to those costs introducing battery storage can make a project so much more bankable because it reduces reliance on those technologies and allows reliance to be shifted to renewable technologies like wind and solar and and just really strengthens the projects from a bank perspective so huge potential um, there are challenges. I just wanted to speak about briefly the challenges basically are, are all questions that are being asked right now by everyone in the market. Let's see if that will move forward for me. There we go. Um, the challenges include that there isn't any agreed technology right now. And and, and a lot of different technologies are being applied. And I think the question is, you know, what is best for your application? And so banks will be asking, when I say challenges, I'm talking about what are the questions banks will be asking, even de development banks. You know, what's the best technology for this? How can I feel confident that that's the right technology for this application? Certainly, lithium is is competing very strongly because of the cost reduction and it seems like that's going to continue. So will that be the dominant technology? Possibly it will be. Um, if that's true, what kinds of warranties should banks be looking at? What kinds of, you know, it's, it, my understanding is that it's so dependent on how you're using the batteries and banks really have to educate themselves on how to protect themselves and, you know, really understand what kinds of, uh, what, what, what should be our expectations for the manufacturer warranties. A huge issue is regulatory changes. Um, there's a lot of question on you know how can a lot of these investments in storage be monetized and and that's something that i think uh, regulation will develop and will change and there could even be tenders that would specifically favor pv with with storage you know demand profiles that would be more tailored to pv with storage so we see the need for this to be uh developed further in the region um but we you know the governments are considering this and working on it now and that's something that that we can add value uh to as well and then for us particularly as a development bank we're really concerned about safety we want to make sure that we're financing technology that it's safe so these are the types of questions that are still being answered our role is to be part of answering these questions you know and to take those risks and to try to test the technologies and to prove them and that's really, you know, what we want to continue doing as we did for the introduction of these assets in the first place. Just to conclude, um, we've been very active in, in bringing PV solar to Latin America. We've been, um, you know, we're still financing a number of projects, very large projects in the region, as well as residential projects. The primary limiting factor is transmission. I would say that cuts across all countries. And, and we want to play a role in financing the transmission, and we are, and bringing in long-term investors through institutional investors. We're working very hard um, on an A loan, B bond product to bring in institutional investors and, and have that long-term 20 years or more financing available, available for these projects. 
given the very competitive prices that are being awarded in the tenders, we need long-term financing. And, and working with governments to create regulatory frameworks to facilitate storage and applying this concept of blended financing to use these donor funds to overcome cost and risk barriers that can help bring technologies in, into the implementation stage. And that's the, that's the end of my, my presentation. And um, please let me know if there are any questions. I'm happy to answer them. Thanks a lot, uh, Elizabeth, for this uh, very interesting presentation. We see already a lot of questions coming in from people that want to know more about uh, IDB's take on uh, a lot of different topics. So that's very good. I would say keep uh, asking the questions. Um, we'll first head to Jorge's presentation, but after the presentation there, we will ask uh, many of these questions to both Elizabeth and Jorge. Um, so as I said, we'll first head to uh, Jorge's presentation. Jorge Barrick is um, here with us today, and he is uh, the he is a senior advisor to private and multilateral and public sector clients on renewable energy project development and finance. Uh, Jorge is also the co-chairman of the, the LACOR board, and in the past he has been working with Echo Resources Incorporation. He has been managing director at NetSource LLC and uh, fund manager at CAF. Um, Jorge, I will give you control over the keyboard and mouse now, so you can uh, start your presentation. Perfect. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Apologies to, um, to the audience if they can't hear me very well. I, I think I fear I've been speaking a fair amount lately and I've been on too many airplanes lately. Um, but let me just, uh, um, hopefully everybody can hear me properly as I'm fighting a cold. All right. So um, I'd like to, um, it, it's, it's not the first time Elizabeth and I, and, and I speak together or in a panel together. And I very much want to highlight some, some important points that I think dovetail very nicely with the, the, the more uh, with the higher level view that we have as a, as an as a nonprofit that is fo focusing precisely on uh, mainstreaming on the mainstreaming of all renewable energy technologies, but not just generation, right? Uh, a system wide integrated approach, and I very much appreciated uh, Elizabeth's points uh, uh, regarding uh, the, the the concept of, of the maturing of the market that they're seeing. Because it's something that we're seeing very frequently, and we're going to be hearing a lot more of that. <coughs> Excuse me. I suspect as we move forward. But I very much want to highlight uh, the fact that Elizabeth didn't focus on uh, on just PV generation. They have had the IDB has had a a leading role in the deployment of PV generation and the financing of this deployment uh, for many years now. And, but at this point, part a sign of the maturity is that we're now looking at the entire system. And so constraints in transmission are a problem actually in many countries. And it's not just transmission, it's distribution. And it's the efficiency of the overall system uh, as well. And so that's where the, uh, the discussion of storage comes in. In addition to that, when we talk about blended finance, it, it can mean several different things. But at the end of the day, it means that there is an entity, whether it's a D IFI or an IFI um, that that will take the lead uh, or, a, or just a development agency that will take the lead in the first studies and the first proofs of concept um, all the way to perhaps uh, taking the, the bulk of the risk for a large uh, in, in new project in a particular country and then allowing then the commercial banks, international commercial banks or um, or local commercial banks to actually also participate in the, in that type of financing. The the uh, so that's another point I wanted to I wanted to highlight is that is that embedded throughout Elizabeth's presentation is that pivotal role that blended finance has had throughout the hemisphere. The third point, which a lot of you probably notice, is this reference to the duck curve. The duck curve essentially means that there's no free lunches and that the market is maturing from the perspective of generation. It used to be that the curve, the curve managed by utilities used to be more like a camel or in some cases like a double hump dromedary, whereby uh, demand could be, could be followed through the day with either two peaks uh, or just one peak, depending on the market. With the introduction of renewables, then uh, those humps actually go down because baseload itself is being covered by renewable energy technologies. And so 
ramping back up for the peaks when there is no sun or there might be you no know, wind is part of the constraint that is mentioned in transmission and in distribution. It's difficult. And that's part of the reason why you need countries need a, especially at this point, countries believe that they need a, a, a mixed, a mixed matrix. Um, okay, let me move forward. Because I think that I think that that point bears highlighting as well. And this is again highlights how the IDB is viewing the entire system and their role uh, to ameliorate and to continue to create a better enabling a better enabling environment, not from not just from the financing side, but also from the technical side and from the infrastructure side. So I'm not going to really spend much time on us. LACOR is a nonprofit. I mentioned that already, and uh, we um, and you you will get a copy of this presentation. But I wanted to also discuss some broad global energy trends that we're that we're seeing. <clears throat> There's a decoupling of energy and economic growth, as well as with GHG emissions. And some of the charts that I will show you, they begin to show the, 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 the impact of this decoupling, meaning that we're becoming much more efficient than we ever have been in human history uh, in terms of producing energy and in, in our productive processes. Efficiency becomes a much, much more important uh, driver. And that's a very important that's a very important point because there are there will continue to be some important advances in technology, but we are getting very close. We're getting close to just being on the margins in terms of the physical constraints of how much power can be generated by a solar cell. So storage becomes supremely important then because we begin to pivot to a different part of the plant, to a different part of the system. There's an impact in it of the increase in electric mobility and an in infrastructure, in addition to just the way we transport ourselves, how we ride share. There's many technology improvements. Technology improvements and lower costs is a sign of market maturity. Um, here's an important other trend, and, and that is and, and and that is the impact and changes brought forth by analytics. You see, you can look at this at this at this. Uh, at the broad industry from a variety of perspectives, you know, but, 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 you know, if you wanted to also to distill a lot of these energy trends into three broad ones, one is, is the, the, the clarity of the fact that, um, that there has been Im important growth, lower costs, a great deal of demystification. It's becoming quite mainstream renewable energy technologies. The second is the power, the empowerment that the demand side is receiving and analytics and microgrids and pay-as-you-go systems are a reflection of that. Uh, the customer and behind the meter systems also are a reflection of that. Net metering, net metering policy is one of those enabling policies that allows for this to happen. And the third is, of course, that we're, we're, we're seeing a reduction in the, uh, a more of a parity in terms of competitive conditions. And that's a really important thing, uh, important development that again signals a type of maturity. But other elements include the mainstreaming, which I mentioned, the social and environmental drivers, and national and international policy drivers, the impact of natural gas. You notice that in, in the bigger markets that Elizabeth shared, there was in at least two of those markets, there, the, the, the competition provided by natural gas, especially in Mexico, is a concern for financing institutions, is part of the risk profile. <clears throat> but renewables are the largest source of energy, have been the largest source of energy growth at this time. And this, this comes from the, the, the recently published 2018 uh, BP, <coughs> BP Energy Outlook. So there is no, there is no, uh, the largest gains in the market share over, the, over 25 years. That's something that is not a mystery to any of us that are involved in this business. Uh, still, within uh, the global energy matrix, renewables are going to still have a smaller share. But to go from 2016 to 0.8% to 3.6% of the entire energy matrix, and this means everything, is significant. That is by no means a small thing. Obviously, uh, we're not taking over the world, but the growth is impressive. It's important, and I think that the, 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 the mainstreaming elements of this maturity are significant to highlight. And so in Latin America, we'll see that that there was a bit of a there was a bit of a dip in terms of uh, this is 
is from a uh, from Bloomberg New Energy Finance. New build renewable energy investment. Um, we've had some very good years. We had a little bit of a dip. Some of that dip is actually because it's because it's renewable energy investment me measured in billions of dollars. Some of that dip actually reflects the lower costs that are being that, that are being experienced in this space, especially in the solar space. And then uh, also from Bloomberg New Energy Finance, Latin America, <coughs> excuse me, clean energy investment expected in 2017 ramps back up. Close attention to the fact that wind and solar uh, are the primary the primary drivers, and auctions are very much uh, one of the main reasons, uh, uh, one of the main factors of growth. Um, in uh, the, the 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 four. And a lot of this is happening in Brazil and Mexico and in Argentina. Some of it, uh, yeah, Brazil, Mexico, and Argentina are the big stories. We expect Colombia will become a bigger story as well soon in the near term. But at this point, these are the areas where grid-connected systems, large grid-connected systems, this is the, the auctions are taking place. And then this is an important slide, also from Bloomberg New Energy Finance, because it shares with you from 2014 through 2017, who were the lead arrangers, the lead financial arrangers? And it won't surprise uh, any of us to see that Bendy Asset from Brazil is uh, is by far the very the, la the largest actor. Now they are re relaunching, not relaunching, but they are they, they are they they have uh, restructured what their offer is going to be. They have made some important announcements, and they will be coming back as a, as, a, as an important financier in Brazil. Uh, but but it's noteworthy to understand to to see that there are four international banks that are present. Uh, well, three international banks that are present, and these are private sector banks. One is a, a Santander from Spain, and then two Japanese banks. Uh, Sumitomo, and also um, also uh, Mits Mitsubishi. Uh, they have taken an important an important role in in uh, in financing a lot of this development. Um, the 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 local banks that are present on this list uh, would be two Brazilian banks, which are Itaú and Bradesco, also private sector banks. It's important to to also note. It's worthwhile to note well the role of the IDB, of course, as a leader in this, but also the role of OPEC, who has taken a a a a, a much a much more aggressive role in in uh, financing directly financing uh, these types of projects, especially these days in the Caribbean and in Central America. <clears throat> These are projections from the Bloomberg New Energy Finance uh, New Energy Finance Report from two, uh, 2036 to 2040, from 2031 to 2035. Where do we see the investment going? And again, we will see that solar and mostly onshore wind, um, mostly onshore wind and solar is is what's expected to be receiving these these investments. So uh, in the near term, the way we see it, uh, from, from, from our perspective, there's more auctions uh, for good connected systems. Uh, some of them are already known. Some of them are coming. Uh, there's, uh, I, I've highlighted the emphasis on energy efficiency, highlighting also the, the trend to empower demand. So behind the meter activities are going to become much more interesting, I believe. And we're seeing that growth. More emphasis on transmission and distribution, uh, not just technical and non-technical losses, but as, uh, as Elizabeth was also mentioning, the infrastructure improvements that are currently constrained, or that in the case of storage, might be able to smooth out that duck curve and therefore make system operators a lot more comfortable and possibly reduce the costs in the, uh, of the entire system. Uh, there's uh, there's lowering bids on grid connected systems. Uh, that at that point, uh, two cents a kilowatt hour. I believe that was from Mexico or El Salvador. I don't remember, but that was a winning bid uh, last week or two, well, last two weeks. I've been in a couple events where the lowest bid in Mexico, at least, was I think 1.7 cents a kilowatt hour. 
So you have to wonder at what point is, is um, you know, what's behind these bids because on its face, they don't look entirely economic. And so therefore, but usually the, but the players who are, who are doing these bids, who are, who are entering these bids are large companies with a great deal of experience and quite strong balance sheets. So uh, they are betting big <coughs> on the ongoing growth of solar PV in um in, in in some important markets like mexico uh energy storage uh, elizabeth mentioned small isolated or, or grid connected systems and grid connected systems is about load shifting in terms of uh in terms of uh of smaller isolated grids especially islands as also highlighted before um energy storage provides an interesting tool for a system that can a renewable energy system with the capacity to provide some base load Microgrids, a big part of the story. Haiti was mentioned. Uh, there's, uh, there's, also, there's also some important developments in, in Colombia, and there's some important developments in Guatemala. Pay-as-you-go systems. Uh, this is be more of a rural electrification uh, scheme. That's also, that, that's also growing. Again, Guatemala and Colombia are the systems that I know best. Uh, increase in corporate demand for services and data, part of the empowerment of the demand. Okay, some addition, some relevant points. Um, a great emphasis uh, on the Northern Triangle countries in Central America and the Caribbean Basin. Again, this was highlighted before. There is an enormous amount, there is an enormous interest in resilience, what's being called the resilience of the infrastructure following the, the unusual hurricane season we had <coughs> last year. And there's several projects already underway in some of these islands to address that with storage, uh, in addition to microgrids and analytics. In South America, the opening uh, of the Argentine market continues to be a big story. The issue there, again, in terms of financing, mentioned by Elizabeth, is that thus far we're, look, we're looking for the first success stories for commercial banks to more fully step in. Um, but thus far, uh, the, 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 that, that ongoing story continues to be considered a success. But there are no private banks yet uh, that are leading, they're taking a lead. Um, Colombia is, 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 uh, is, is changing some of its internal, internal structure, including strengthening its infrastructure so that they will be able to, be, to, to, to launch some auctions. Uh, Brazil, and then the big story as well as Mexico, and the complexity with Mexico has a direct impact on um, direct impact on financing is twofold. One is the uncertainty of the future of the coming elections, and two is the fact that prices are already very low, and natural gas uh, coming mostly coming from the U.S., but Mexico has a fair amount of natural gas too, uh, is is a a strong competitor. <coughs> Um, let's see. Now, uh, there is an economic case to be made in most of these Caribbean islands. However, um, however, the systems tend to be smaller. And so the way to approach these types of projects is different. Um, there's also a regulatory case in the, in the case of energy, energy effic efficiency in Mexico and Colombia. But in addition to that, renewable energy auctions or renewable portfolio standards. Um, but another, another, another important trend that, that we're seeing is that corporate policy requiring, especially from North America, for companies from North America and, and the European Union, requiring that certain percentage of power come, be sourced from renewable energy. That has become a big market driver, especially in some of these island nations. And... Uh, also, a certain percentage of improvement in energy efficiency is necessary as well. Some of these examples, Dominican Republic, Trinidad and Tobago, but that has to be a measurable and trackable. Market differentiation is another, is, another, is, another, is another trend that we see with specific market actors. Early tech, tech uh, adoption, batteries and St. Lucia, analytics and microgrids in Haiti, uh, pay-as-you-go systems, Guatemala, Colombia. Let's see. Challenges: the low cost, uh, you know, low cost, uh, and, and a great deal of competition in the four countries for financing. Uh, where, 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 
where financing remains a challenge and uh, and and the role of the IDB is highlighted um you know pricing the low cost of pricing is an issue also how was well, the tenor of the PPA um the uncertainties from uh, from uh, from a political perspective <clears throat> financing challenges do remain especially for projects of lower scales savings versus revenue opportunities uh, is in making the business case is not so clear cut and the decision making process <coughs> if it's not an auction and you're just dealing with a private sector with a private PPA with a private sector PPA which can be done in many of these countries uh, the system may not be grid connected maybe behind the meter it's still a difficult it's still a difficult sale it's still difficult to make that happen and it can be difficult to finance because they tend to be smaller projects sometimes under a million dollars and those are complex and there's still that gap there's still that area that gap of projects under five million dollars and over a hundred thousand dollars or under three million and, and over five hundred thousand uh, where it is difficult to find financing and the local banks haven't really stepped up um, I think oh well this is from Bloomberg New Energy Finance it just shows a downward push in bid pricing which actually I think has been overtaken recently in fact mostly in Latin America okay so I'm gonna stop here because uh, I, I'd like uh, some time for questions as well um, I look forward to the conversation thank you Thank you, Jorge, for this uh, interesting presentation as well. And indeed, uh, I think it's good to leave some time for the for the questions uh, because we are receiving quite a lot. Um, <clears throat> one uh, question I want to start with uh, is to you, Elizabeth. Uh, in the um, in the slides of Jorge, you saw uh, as well, of course, and you know that IDB has taken an active role in financing uh, renewables. Uh, and now that uh, the markets are getting more mature, we, uh, some, some people are wondering if uh, the role of the IDB is changing and if at some point uh, you think it's necessary to take a step back or to, to change your focus. Well, the truth is, um, I think we're, we're, we need to maintain our focus in, on renewables and sustainability and, and that's something that we have a mandate from our, from our member countries. But we we change the way we do that. I think it's true that you know for a standard PV project, it, you know with a PPA, we don't really have much of a role. There's depending on the country. I mean, it, it depends. You know, but in in the countries I talked about, you know, um, maybe minus Argentina, there really are commercial banks that will come in and finance those projects and. Um, do it faster than us and do it, you know, in, in a very efficient way. And so we, we do try to say, where can we add value um, in relation to this process? And, and now we see as a shift to looking at new technologies, which could be solar or, or storage or other types of storage, battery storage or other types of storage, but also in trying to bring new capital to the markets. And we have a, a role right now that we're really focused on trying to bring institutional investors, uh, hedge funds, you know, pension funds into these markets by offering financial products, like either a guarantee so that they can remove the project risk. They don't have much appetite for construction risk in particular, even of construction of PV projects. But, but also, um, you know, covering them with our, our umbrella, our multilateral umbrella, preferred creditor status in some of these um, countries uh, where, you know, they might not feel totally comfortable investing, but investing under our umbrella makes it easier. So we've had quite a bit of success with that product and we'll continue to do that. Um, so and and then also with the regulatory, we do have these very strong relationships with the government. We worked with the government of Uruguay on the negotiation of the PPA in Uruguay. The same in Argentina, trying to get these um, PPAs to be bankable. So we'll continue, I think, that role as well as a sort of liaison between the private sector and the government. But mainly, I think our focus is still going to be in the same sector, but sort of shifting the way that we're are where we're focused, where we're entering the market. 
Okay, okay. Thanks for that. Um, Jorge, there's a question for you that uh, you spent quite some time talking about the, the tenders, of course, and the, the auctions. And uh, yeah, well, as you showed also with the Bloomberg, Bloomberg slide, is that the, the prices are dropping there. And the criticism is that what we often hear is that um, the, these low prices are only, uh, only the big companies are ab able to offer these low prices, and that for smaller com companies is not possible. Uh, to compete with that, do you think, therefore, that these these pricing scheme are, um, yeah, that it would be possible to maintain this in the long run, or do you think it's only for now to, yeah, to to grab a market share for the bigger companies and then uh, the prices will go up again? Well, it, you know, as 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 we saw, uh, it, these lower prices appear to be a trend, but they're not everywhere. Um, in some more mature markets, they they are a fact. And we believe, uh, and, and it looks like, I should say, it looks like it is a, it is part of a market share strategy. It also, it also could incorporate other elements that we're not aware of. For instance, uh, they're banking on savings on balance of plant systems, right? Or savings, uh, savings in terms of the installation, or perhaps they have, uh, they have also agreed to, they have also agreed to uh, sell part of their power at peaking rates uh, during uh, given certain conditions, and so that allows um, that allows for them to get closer to well, get better get better rates of uh, rates of return. I think that uh, <clears throat> I think that that's a that that's a legitimate question, but I think that it's also part of the shakeout that's going to be happening in some of these markets as they approach maturity. Um, I think that we are. Uh, well, I, I hasten, I, no, I hesitate to say whether or not we've reached the limit in terms of the low prices. But it, it is, but it is a good sign for the market that this, uh, that that these technologies, uh, generation technologies, are competitive in this way. And if, in fact, the entire integrated system can be, can um, for the for a PPA for the right tenor uh, provide power at these at these levels, I think that in the end, all uh, the consumer, the consumer is the one who benefits. Uh, for smaller companies, it uh, it may well be that it may well be that they partner differently to participate, or they uh, or they niche into into market carve outs that could be could be created. A lot of them probably with industrial customers, uh, private PPAs, or behind the meter type of schemes. I would I would think I've seen that in other countries. Interesting, and um, <clears throat> uh, the, these tenders, of course, uh, mainly happen happen in the the big four marks, also that you spend most time talking on, Elizabeth. And a question from the audience is that um, how do how do you how would you go about educating local banks in, for long term finance and opening up the market, especially in all these other the smaller markets? Yeah, I I mean. I think that's kind of that's what we were able to do in in Chile. Obviously, there's this very sophisticated banking market. It didn't take a whole lot of educating them, um, but it is more of a challenge in in other markets. Um, sometimes it it's not really related to education. You know, um, these there are very good bankers in a lot of these countries, but the system is set up in such a way. You know, in Brazil. For example, you know, the, it's very hard to be competitive with the interest rates that exist given the macroeconomic environment, but also it's set up in a way where everyone's happy that, you know, BNDS takes the majority of the risk and the local banks offer construction financing with a sponsor guarantee. And, 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 you know, everyone's sort of happy with that. And there's this inertia that we, we feel like is, is tough to change. Um, that, that we've been trying to demonstrate, okay, this is how we would structure this with, we're taking the construction risk. We don't need a guarantee from the sponsor for the construction risk because it's something that we can mitigate through a good EPC. And, you know, so I think, we do it just by demonstrating it in a number of countries. We have we have people uh, located, members of our team that are based in um, each of our member countries of our borrowing member countries in the region, and they're meeting with local bankers and talking to them. And uh, we have a syndication team that reaches out to banks to you know describe projects and try to bring banks in. Um, and and so 
it's it's a number of ways that we do it, um, and and I think um, it, it takes some time in some markets more than others, and it takes you know a lot of the PPAs are also indexed to dollars, so um, local banks don't necessarily have an advantage in that case um, if they have to borrow in dollars to find fund the loans. So there's a lot of factors, but um, I, I think. Um, you'll see some development in that area in certain countries, particularly in Argentina, um, um, in the near term. A lot of potential in, in Mexico as well, where a lot of local banks are already very active in Chile. If I if I might add something there, I I, I agree absolutely with Elizabeth, and uh, I, I would just add that um, we did, I did a study uh, for CAF um, some time ago, focusing precisely on that question. And there's a layer inside, in terms of institutional culture, inside of the banks as well, where the objective uh, is not lined up with, with, with uh, the objective of the institution itself isn't entirely lined up with the objectives of the loan department or of the risk management department. And so there's some dissonance inside, which little by little is being addressed. And in some markets, as Elizabeth said, it's uh, they're, they're, they're moving quite fast in, in addressing those. But there are several layers, right? Because at the end of the day, institutions are institutions and people are people. And so you will find that sometimes uh, the, the obstacles are, are reside inside the corporate culture of the institution itself, especially for smaller local banks in smaller markets. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, Jorge, the the question to, to you was as, uh, specifically also in Colombia. Uh, you mentioned already that um, yeah that it's going uh, a bit slower, even that they're still working on the policies. But do you, do you see uh, what do you see is necessary to happen there for this market to fully take off? Well, there's there are several elements that are important in the Colombian market. Colombia is primarily high, it's set up as a base load system. Most of its generation is, uh, if I recall correctly, or a large bulk of its generation is hydro. Um, they have coal, they have some natural gas as well. Uh, and, uh, and so the way that uh, power is dispatched and the way that, um, and the way that it's paid, it, it, it has to do with, with what's in Spanish called potencia firme or baseload. And, uh, and renewable energy can't offer that. So for a very long time, uh, even though Colombia took the lead early on with the first wind projects in La Guajira some time ago, which is that peninsula right above Venezuela, uh, it um, it kind of stayed with a small number of uh, non-hydro renewable energy projects. It's it's really interesting, and, and the other constraint has been interconnection. Colombia is a very very much a geographically abrupt country, so. There are quite a few, uh, it's, uh, connecting the country from an infrastructure perspective has been a struggle. And I think that there are some important projects underway and some important projects planned uh, to strengthen the transmission and distribution infrastructure. And that's going to help, uh, help integrate renewable energy technologies, especially in the areas where it's recognized Colombia has a very strong uh, potential. Um, but the other element is, as I mentioned, the regulatory side. And so, and that I understand is also uh, being addressed. And, and Jorge, just to add to that, I agree with you, the, the regulatory side, there's this sort of political element where you have elections taking place this year and, you know, what will be the priorities of the new administration? Nobody knows, but in reality, demand is not growing in, in Colombia right now. They have a lot of hydropower and a lot of other priorities to focus on. And so they do have this huge peer pressure, you know, to develop some sort of auction process because all these other countries have had such success. And I think that will be primarily the main driver, to be honest with you, the peer pressure. But the, the challenge there will be um, you know, the PPAs, because there is this sort of market practice of very short term PPAs in, in or, you know, in, in Colombia. And so trying to get the, the shift to a long term PPA, I think, will be a challenge. That is correct. Thank you. Yes, very, very, very much so. 
Okay, uh, we, we are receiving a lot of questions still and quite some of, our, of them are very uh, detailed. Um, we will try to, after this um, webinar, we'll also make a short summary in which we will try to address some of the questions. Maybe we can send them to Kirk and Elizabeth still and they can answer to them. But I want to touch upon one more topic on which we received a few questions and on which both Elizabeth and Kirk uh, touched upon in their presentation, which is a uh, battery storage. Um, and I'm curious to hear from, from both of you, uh, Elizabeth, you mentioned that in Chile it's already taking off. What Do you expect that battery storage will uh, yeah, play a big role in development of solar in the up upcoming years? And also what development do you expect there? Do, do you, uh, how fast do you think that, that will go? Well, my view, um, and just speaking for myself and having done some research on this lately, is that it's going to be a huge role. It's going to have a very, very big role. And it will be, um, you know, as the price of this com combination of PV solar and storage continues to fall and becomes more and more competitive, I see it as a game changer, honestly, where a lot of these baseload technologies you know, will will be replaced over time. The the the, the storage um, the cost is still, you know, it increases your project cost right now depending on the number of hours you want by a meaningful amount, right? Twenty five, fifty percent. You know, so it's not going to be competitive right now um, with with in these auctions where the they're so competitive, you know, and the prices are so low, as Jorge was saying. Um, but as you have more and more of this duck curve issue and you need some load shifting, um, the projects just won't make sense without it, you know, and, and, and the costs will continue to come down and the safety issues will be vetted and uh, people will become more and more comfortable with it. And this project we're doing in Haiti is just one example where you're able to reduce the dependence, you know, the um, increase the amount of energy that's being produced um, from the solar project that's serving these municipalities, and it's a relatively small load that it's serving, but you increase it from 30% with battery storage to 88% because the batteries are able to um, take over and, and you know, um, basically replace the, the diesel that you would otherwise use during a lot of these hours. And so um, we see a very big potential for it and we want to be part of it. And so we, we're really eager to hear about um, developers with projects with storage. Yeah, to add to that, <clears throat> um, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think storage is a fact. It's coming. Uh, it's, it's more economic in some applications than others. It's more economic in some markets than others. That's, we've seen that before. So um, that, uh, that, 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 that's just a fact. And it can be, for some markets, a game changer. Uh, the, I, I think that, uh, I think that, that, in, that if I was, if, well, as a vendor, if I was developing the type of projects that would require storage, I probably would focus on uh, on markets where that where that load shifting is a critical factor. Where managing that duck curve is supremely important. It might become a competitive a competitive issue on the one hand, but on the other hand, I'd probably focus on small island systems. And uh, there's real there's in addition to the Haiti project. There's an extremely interesting project um, underway in St. Lucia right now, which I think is a 10 to 15 megawatt uh, PV system, grid tied, but with 10 megawatt hours of storage as part of it. This is quite significant. It's a small market, small island, uh, but still, in terms of the resilience and the strength that that can provide that system, I think that as, as to use Elizabeth's words, it's a game changer for some of these for, for some of these electrical systems. And so I continue to expect good things from storage. I think we will, that story is still unfolding. It's a really exciting part of, um, of the PV, uh, of the deployment of PV throughout the Americas. And I expect, uh, I, I expect additional movement there, uh, especially on the cost and efficiency side. We're only going to get better there, I believe. That's great. And uh, good to end on such a positive note I would say. 
Uh, I want to thank you both, Elizabeth and Jorge, for your time and for sharing your expertise with us on, uh, well, about the financing of solar PV, but also about uh, storage and all these other developments in the region, in Latin America. Um, as we said in the beginning, the slides will be available soon and also the recordings will be made available late this week. You will get an email about that. Um, well, as you have seen on the screen, uh, there, there are two conferences coming up, uh, which uh, I would like to highlight to you, the Unlocking Solar Capital LAC in Miami, uh, 28 and 29 June, which we organized together with LACOR, and also the, uh, the conference in Argentina on 8 and 9, 9 May in Buenos Aires. Uh, we hope to see you there. For now, I would like to wish you all a pleasant day and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you.